Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. My name is Christina and today is going to be a spooky story video. Basically my spooky stories is where I tell you guys a spooky story or something a little, you know, bizarre, strange, unusual, and I do my makeup while I'm telling you guys the story. It's basically a more in-depth or more interesting get ready with me. So let's go ahead. I don't want to talk too much. Let's just go ahead and get into today's story. As always, I will not be talking about the makeup. So if you are interested in anything that I've used on my face, it will all be down in the description below. And as I'm sure you guys can see from the title of this video today, we talking about one of my favorite topics, witches, bitches. I love me a good witch. What can I say? And for the first time, I think in spooky story history, I am taking us somewhere other than the United States. I've been very isolated in my story location, so I do apologize, but this time I decided we would go across the pond, we'd go over to England for this one, and talk about some witches. So today's witches are what a lot of people call either the Lancaster witches or the Pendle Hill witches. I've seen both. Uh, they're both the same, but both names I have seen fairly frequently. Uh, but it interchanges, it seems like. And the majority of my viewership is from America to begin with. So a lot of us are really familiar with the Salem witch trials, which for me was always like the OG witch trials. The Pendle Hill witches actually happened first, or the, those witch trials happened first. The Salem witch trials, of course, happened in Salem, Massachusetts in 1692, I believe, or 42. 1692? 1692, I was right the first time. The Pendle Hill Witches, however, happened in 1612. So long before the Salem Witch Trials ever took place, these were already happening. And I think notably the reason why I wanted to talk about these, this is one of the more popular or well-known witch trials in, in the world. Not only because it's one of the earliest ones that we are aware of, but because it's the earliest one we're aware of that was well-documented. This was so well-documented for the 17th century and it is interesting and kind of like scary in like a lot of aspects mainly because the trial largely hinged on the on the testimony of a nine-year-old girl i mean that alone scares me can't be trusting these children but anyways let's backtrack the pendle witches lived during the time of queen elizabeth the first and james the king james the first so the early 1600s. During the time, it was said that King James had a belief that witches were real to begin with, or that witchcraft was real in general, which I think was a large thing throughout the globe or at that point, or this belief that witchcraft and evil existed and the sole purpose of the rest of us being here. And I mean, what I mean by the rest of us is the non-witches was to get rid of evil. So King James I definitely believed in witchcraft and evil and that it needed to be, you know, dealt with. He actually enacted an act, basically a law or a covenant at this time that stated if you were for making a covenant with an evil spirit, using a corpse for mag magic, hurting life or limb, procuring love or injuring cattle by any means of charms. That act was put forth with those as the underlying factors. And if you were caught doing any of those things, it was death. That's it. Death penalty. No, like, no send you off to jail for any amount of time. No, like, cust customer service. Well, I mean, customer service is kind of a, is kind of a prison sentence. No sort of like community service was given, nothing like that. Nope, just death. So I think looking at it from like a societal perspective, like it was definitely like this whole mentality that, you know, witches existed and they needed to be dealt with in a very strict fashion, apparently. Going back to the Pendle witches, like I said, a lot of the testimony or a lot of the case hinged on the testimony of a nine-year-old girl. And like I said at the beginning, while that's kind of scary that like they trusted the, the word of a child so incredibly much, I think the scarier part is, is that a lot of the people that she was accusing of witchcraft at the time or for being witches at the time were her own family members. There's no loyalty here, apparently. But it wasn't just her family, apparently the, the the majority of the Pendle witches came from two families in total. The majority of one coming from the girl who accused them of being witches, but there was also a rivalry family. I don't know what that means for the 16th century. All I can think is Shakespeare and Romeo and Juliet. 
which I don't know if that's what it means, but it was two families that were at odds. So we had the Dimdike family, which is how I'm assuming that's pronounced. I will put the names up on the screen for you guys because I'm probably butchering these names. And the Chaddix family. These are the two families that for the most part were accused of being witches. In total, there was, I think, 12 people accused, 11 people tried, and 10 people ultimately found guilty, is how it all broke down. So 10 people were put to death because of this, and it ranged between the two families. So a lot of people claim that the altercation began when John Lowe, a pauper, came across, Al I'm gonna assume it's Allison device or Alison device, it's the name of the person, was a beggar and was walking down a street and saw John and decided, you know, to do what she does and begged for some, I think they said pins, which I don't know what kind of pins they mean, like pins to put, to put in voodoo dolls. I don't, I don't know. It was unclear whether she was gonna pay for these or she just wanted John to give them to her. John apparently refused to give her any of these pins and it is claimed that Allison then decided she was gonna curse John. Shortly after denying Allison these pins, John ended up actually suffering from a curse and he had a stroke. I don't believe he passed away because it does say that he claimed he knew it had to be Allison who did it to him. So he did not die from the stroke. It was just, you know, bad luck. John decided to bring this case to court and Allison decided in court to say that the devil told her to do it. The devil told her to curse John and maim him basically, but not kill him. Upon further questioning, not only was she going to, you know, claim that the devil was telling her to do things, she decided she would just throw her grandma under the bus. Another person of her family she also accused, and then some of the Chaddix family she decided would, she would also accuse. They're, they're all witches, the devil is telling them all to do these things. They believe that she called out part of the Chaddix family out of revenge for, I guess, John bringing up anything. I, I couldn't find if John was related to the Chaddix family, but I'm, I'm guessing he was. James Dim Dimdike also said that Allison had cursed a child at some point in the village. He also confessed that the mother had a mark on her body um, and that mark was supposedly where the devil had drawn blood because he needed to drink it. The devil was thirsty and a vampire. But basically all of these accu accusations between Allison, her family, and the Chaddix family there, there's a lot going on. There was a lot of accusations between the two families of them being like, well, this person died because of this person and this person died because of this person. That's a, it was a lot of like, he said, she said, and these families are just going at it, just fully blaming each other for everything. Um, but again, Allison was throwing her family under the bus. Every, like she, she did not care, you guys. So the trials began on the 17th through the 19th of August in 1612. The oldest Demdike family member did not even make it to trial. She unfortunately passed in the prison where they were holding them before trial. It was dark, dank, not great conditions. So she did unfortunately pass and never made it to trial. So that was one of the people who did pass away. And then the, this is where the nine-year-old comes in. So the nine-year-old is named Jeanette or Janet Device. She's nine years old and she is called as like the case witness, basically. The entire thing kind of hinges on this child. So under the act that King James put forth, like I mentioned earlier, which trials didn't need the same kind of evidence that other trials would need. Evidence was kind of like, eh, you don't really need it in this, you know? Which trials, they different. So someone so young normally in any other kind of case proceeding wouldn't be ad like admissible at all. Like she would not have been allowed to testify. She wouldn't have been allowed to be a key witness and provide evidence in any way. But because this was a witch trial, it was different. So Jeanette or Jeanette gave her evidence and she basically called out a bunch of people. But the like scary thing and the wildest thing to me was that she called out her own family members, her mother and her sister being among the people that she called out as being witches and supplied evidence against, which basically with how these witch trials worked during the time, I mean, they were done. That's a death sentence, you know? The odd thing about this case too is that some of the people accused of being witches seem to believe that they were actually witches. Allison being one of those people that like truly seemed to believe that she was a witch. She believed in her powers. 
So, I mean, that's something to be said about that. But there was a lot of other people, like the mother of Jenna. She didn't did not know that she was gonna be called a witch this day. Not only was this trial, you know, basically hinging on the word of a nine-year-old, which again, wouldn't normally be something that would be allowed. The witches in question were not allowed counsel of any sort. They weren't allowed to speak on their own behalf. They weren't allowed to present evidence in the contrary or evidence at all, really. So they were really just left up to the opinions of the people of the court and whatever person decided that day they were they were witches there i mean as far as like court proceedings go it was definitely not well done it's very similar to the salem witch trials it was basically if you were going to be accused of being a witch you were a witch and that's all that that's all there was to it i mean it's the old adage of the ridiculous trials that they did to prove that you were a witch or not if you throw her in water and she and she drowns, she is not a witch, but if she lives, she's a witch. So either way, once you got accused of being a witch, it was all over for you. And so in this case, like I said, 12 people were accused of being witches. One of them died in holding. The other 10 of them were accused and then one, one person was actually let go. So I don't know what exactly happened in her case. Margaret Pearson was one of the people accused and she actually was let go. She got proven innocent somehow. So I guess she is the exception to the rule of once you're called a witch, you're, you're a witch. Cause she definitely didn't, didn't face any consequences like other people did. And the reason I'm bringing this whole story up as a spooky story is because in the area where the Lancaster or the Pendle Hill witches were hung at the gallows, that hill has a lot of reports of ghosty sightings. Even up till recently, there have been sightings at this location. A lot of people refuse to go to this hill because of the spooky nature of it. And again, that's why they're called like the Pendle Hill Witches too, because it, they were hung on a hill. The hill itself like actually looks really pretty to me, but apparently, yeah, really spooky. Over the last like few years, a lot of people go up to this hill and they'll do Ouija board sessions and a lot of people think that the more people that are going to this area and doing things like that, it's awakening something over here. And, and people are starting to see apparitions of these ghosts now hanging out on Pendle Hill. This location is also a great touristy kind of spot or a place for locals to go during spooky season. They do offer tours in the area and a lot of people claim they see stuff on these tours though. They see, you know, the apparitions of all of these witches and that generally the vibe is odd there. I think one of the more interesting accounts that I found was a psychic medium visited Pendle Hill and had their camera out and they claim that on their camera, they captured the apparition of a ghostly woman. And I'll put the picture up on the screen for you right now. So definitely form your own opinions on what you think this is, but it kind of looks like a person, but this was taken outside of Pendle Hill. The person who took the photo did say at the time of taking the photo and around the time of taking all of these photos, they did feel apprehensive in the area. Like someone was watching them, like following them in a way. And that overall, they just felt really uneasy that they were almost not even surprised when they saw this like ghostly figure in the photo. The woman believes that the photo captured the ghostly apparition of Janet Device, which you guys know that's the little girl who spoke against her family. What I have not mentioned yet and why I think her theory might be sound if this is really a ghost. Years after Janet basically accused her family of being witches and sent them to the gallows, someone decided to do the same thing to her. And only years later, Janet also found herself in the midst of a witch trial. And she was also sentenced to death for being a witch. All I can say is karma is a bitch <laughs> because if you were a witch, you would have seen it come in Janet. But this isn't the only ghostly sighting. A lot of people say they see full grown apparitions a lot. There's also like a mysterious dog that is seen walking amongst the hills, maybe a devil dog. I mean, if they were witches, 
and they were in cahoots with the devil and must be like a hellhound is what I'm assuming. But that is the story of the Pendle Hill witches or the Lan Lan Lancashire, Lancashire witches, whichever one you want to call them. Just another spooky ooky, you know, witch trial, which ultimately all I've learned from history is that witch trials were basically a, a death nail in a coffin because there was very little chance you were coming out of that alive. And apparently even if you were someone who accused someone of being a witch, you were not safe either. And then ultimately the price you pay is you may come back as a spooky ooky ghost who, you know, has to walk around for the rest of eternity going, what the heck happened? If I'm ever able to visit England and visit Lancashire, then I would love to do a ghost tour here. Have any of you guys done this ghost tour or ghost tours in general where you've actually seen something? I have no, I've been on a few ghost tours. I've never seen anything. I'm scared of the dark though, so I was still scared, <laughs> but I haven't actually seen anything. But let me know, would you do a ghost tour to see if you could find any of the Pendle Hill witches? Would you be interested? And that guys is today's spooky story. Thank you so much for watching. I hope all of you are ready for Halloween. Halloween is in a, less than a week now. I'm very excited, but thank you guys for being here. Give the video a thumbs up if you liked it. Also hit that subscribe button if you wanna hang out with me at any other point. I, I, I do makeup things and project pan things. So definitely hit that if you are interested and I will see you guys in the next one. Remember, there are always spooks to be found. Bye.